1 Peter chapter 5. So, ready to start? All right, so let me begin with a question this morning, and the question is this. It's just kind of a personal question here, but I don't want you to answer out loud um, or raise your hand or anything, so it's just something to think about. But the question is, how many of you are truly enjoying life? I mean, honestly, come here today, and man, you just really, truly enjoying life. Versus, how many of you are stressed and struggling? (laughs) Doesn't seem like that, and I do emphasize seem, it doesn't seem like that the majority of believers, or at least the believers that I'm around today, uh, and I'm not saying this any critical of the church, but I... You know, I, I interact with believers other than just those people at Olivet, but you know, I've been a part of pastoral ministry now for 15 years, and it just doesn't seem like the majority of believers are enjoying life. Uh, matter of fact, it seems that most are stressed and, and stressed about everything, uh, money, marriage, children, job, self, you name it, uh, just a lot of stress, a lot of frustration going on, and even as I say that, I'm not saying that as something critical, but uh, it's just kind of something that I've noticed over the years, but what I've also noticed over the years as God has dealt with me, and I want you to understand that, that as God was dealt with me and has shown me a lot of what is below the surface with this stress and this frustration that I deal with, I've started to see and pay attention and realize it's in everybody else as well. So when you think about what lies beneath the surface of stress and frustration, I truly believe that what's happening, and people can call it whatever they want, but I truly believe what I've discovered is that a lot of people, and I know I've struggled with it and still struggle with it, is an identity crisis. Anybody ever had one of those? You know, just really struggling with who am I, you know? What am I here for? Am I really making a difference? Is my life really counting and mattering for something? You find that all of us long for significance in the world, right? We want to matter. We want to know that our life has counted for something. But Satan, on the other hand, from the beginning, has longed to deceive us and to get us to embrace an identity other than the one that God gave us or has given us, right? Think about Adam and Eve. God created them to enjoy him and to enjoy his creation, to walk with him. And so the enemy comes along and he convinces Adam and he convinces Eve that uh, there's something better. There's something better than what you were created to enjoy. There's something outside of God that you need to truly experience life and happiness. I don't know about you, but I've bought that lie, hook, line, and sinker, sinker, and really struggled because of it. But even deeper, even beneath this identity crisis, what I found is that there's another struggle going on, and that brings us to what we've been talking about for the last couple of months. So even beneath the identity crisis, there's another struggle going on between two voices that we're hearing. One is the voice of God, which is good, and the other is the voice of evil, which is the enemy. And so underneath that identity crisis, there's a struggle of voices, these two voices that are speaking into our lives. And so the truth is, we're either listening to and believing one or the other of those voices. So what I find, even beneath the identity crisis, when you get down to the nitty-gritty bottom of it all, what you find is that all of us have a worship problem who we listening to and who we're ultimately hearing, believing, bowing down to and accepting what they say. So what are we bowing down to? Which voice are we 
hearing? Is it the voice of accusation that comes from the accuser? Or is it truly the voice of the Spirit of God who wants to lead us to the truth which sets us free? You see, the enemy does not want you to understand what is really going on below the surface. He would just assume you continue to deal with your frustrations from a fleshly perspective and never get down deep and allow the Spirit of God who lives into you to truly deliver you and set you free from really what you're already delivered and set free from. <laughs> that sounds interesting, but it's true. The enemy wants your identity to be wrapped up in everything but God. Is that clear? So I want to test you just for a minute. Uh, just, just a little quick test. Because what happens is, for me, sometimes the enemy just lulls you to sleep. And you're assuming everything's good. You're assuming your identity's wrapped up in Christ and all those things. Let me ask you something. What happens when you lose your job? What, what would happen if you lost the money that you had? I mean, some of you may have a lot of money. I don't know, but what, what happens if you lose your money? Who, who are you then? What happens if you lose the stuff? What happens if you lose your wife? What happens if you lose your husband? What, what then? Young people. You know, there's so many things that the enemy uses to try to get our identity wrapped up in. It's, it's crazy. The clothes you wear, the, the phone that you carry around, the people you hang around with, uh, the sports teams that you play on, and all those different things. I mean, it's unbelievable how the enemy will take us and get us so consumed into those things. That's why I truly believe one of the most depressing times of my life is when I graduated high school. You would think it would have been the happiest time, but it was really the most depressing time because everything that my identity had been wrapped up in for all those years of high school, guess what? It's now over. <laughs> you see, that's what can happen to you if you're not careful, right? And then I got into ministry, and then I started wrapping all my identity up and standing behind the pulpit and, and trying to see how many people I could get to come hear me preach. And that's very dangerous because in that situation, you know, you, you feel like you're doing well and everything's going great. But again, you may not always have that. And the enemy would love for us to wrap ourselves up and to identify ourselves based on the things of this world. But you know, what's interesting is that when life gets tough and when life really starts to squeeze on you, it's kind of like a toothpaste tube or whatever, man. You don't really know what's inside until you put some squeeze on it, right? <laughs> but when you squeeze it, what's inside starts to come out. And so that's what happens in life. Things get a little bit difficult. We start to get squeezed, and then who we really are, who we believe that we are, starts to really come out in us. First Peter chapter 5, I want to read verse 8. And the devil is not going to be the focus of our message today. Amen? I'm not even giving him that priority or that place. But here's what it says. It says, be sober. It says, be vigilant. And here's the reason why. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Let me read it one more time. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So knowing we have an enemy, knowing what he's all about, knowing his tactics, what do we do? So Peter led by the Holy Spirit, calls for balance in our life. He says, be sober. He says, be vigilant. It's interesting when you begin to investigate these words, and I always like to look at what's underneath here, to see what's underneath the surface and look at the language. You do know that the Bible was written in Greek, Hebrew and Aramaic, so just, just thought I would throw that out. So underneath each English word, there's a Greek word, okay? And so... 
as I look at these words, here's what I find. Number one, I look at the word sober. And according to Thayer's Greek Dictionary, it means in a spiritual way to be calm and collected in spirit. Now, for us in a physical way, we just think it means don't be drunk, right? If you're sober, you're just not drunk. But in a spiritual way, what does it mean? Well, spiritually speaking, it means calm and collected in spirit. Okay? That's important. But what strikes me, though, and what's so interesting to me is the fact that Peter says this, and then he talks about this opponent we have, this accuser that we have, that's going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I don't know if you've ever studied lions, but they are truly the most ferocious animal in the jungle. Amen? I mean, that's why they're referred to as the king of the jungle. So it's interesting that he tells me to be calm and collected in spirit when he's also telling me I've got a, a roaring lion that's trying to devour me. Are, are you serious, Peter? Did you really mean that? Calm, collected? Really? So you, you know that you're in the jungle and there's a lion that's after you and uh, the last thing I'm probably going to be is calm and collected. What about you? So it's almost like, Peter, you, you, you want me to be what? You want me to be sober, calm, collected in spirit. But then he uses another word. He says be sober, but he also says be vigilant. Be vigilant. So according to Thayer's dictionary here, it means to be attentive means to be cautious. Now, I don't know about you, but this makes a little bit more sense, right, in terms of the idea of what he says is out there, you know, going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. This makes a little more sense, like be on alert, <laughs> be attentive, pay attention, be cautious, right? But what we've got to remember this morning is that it's not either or, it's both. Right? You looking at it? He didn't say be sober or be vigilant. Right? He says be both. So he's calling literally, I've never seen this before, but he's calling for balance in the Christian life. It's odd because it would be like me walking up to one of you right now and saying like to you, Dalton, it would, like, it, it would be like me walking up to you or one of your coaches coming up to you from football and saying, Dalton, I want you to be fast and slow. Now, what do you think Dalton's going to do? He's going to go, which one, coach? Fast or slow? You know? And so that, that sounds odd, but it's, it's really the same here. But he's really calling for us to be sober and to be vigilant. vigilant. He's really calling for us to be calm and collected in spirit, but at the same time be cautious and attentive. He's calling for balance there. So what's the purpose of this balance? Is it just so that we can be happy? I mean, is that really the point? Is this, hey, we need to live a balanced life between being calm and cool versus being careful, cautious, and attentive just so we can be happy. Is that it? It's not what the text says. The text says be sober, be vigilant because your adversary. Ladies and gentlemen, you have an opponent. This was a term used for one uh, that was against you in a particular lawsuit, one who opposes you, okay? You have an adversary, the devil, okay, who walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, I grew up with an older sister, and I want you to understand that there were a lot of times when I aggravated her and she aggravated me. She would probably argue that it's probably more me aggravating her than anything, but, you know, what I've learned is the enemy is not like a little aggravating brother who just wants to pester to get on your nerves because the little aggravating brother really loves his sister, you know, right? That's the truth. I mean, my kids are always getting on each other's nerves, but I know they love each other. 
I see it all the time. But I've learned that the devil is not a little aggravating brother. Because the Bible says he's going about seeking whom he may devour. Do you realize that in other places in the text that this has been translated in the English as swallow up? As to literally like swallow something up, you know? So he's not out here just to aggravate you and to make life difficult. Understand, as Jesus said, the thief hath come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, ladies and gentlemen. He's not playing games here. He's not going down without a fight. All right? He's going to just, man, he's going to flail away as long as he has opportunity to do it. We have an opponent. He is known as the devil. And when you look under that English word, you find the Greek word diabolos. And it means accuser. Because the enemy is one who loves to make accusations about you. You remember the two voices? You remember the whole identity crisis that we struggle with? (laughs) I mean, that other voice is the voice of the enemy who wants to tell you that you're more than you really are. He wants to tell you that you're a nobody, good for nothing, not really amounting to anything in this life, and to try to get you on that path to where you're trying to find your significance in everything but God. You have a real enemy. We must learn to be balanced because if we don't, what Peter's saying, we're going to have big problems with our adversary, with the accuser. Because you see, sober, being sober, calm and collected in spirit, without vigilance, that equates to laziness, right? And we don't want to get lazy, right? Because we know the enemy's there. He's going about. We want to make sure that we're attentive, but if we get lazy, we don't see his attacks. And before you know it, hey, you guys know this, right? We can be so easy going before you know it, man, we have gone way, way farther than we ever intended to go with something. On the other hand, vigilance without being sober or calm and collected in spirit equates to stress. And frustration, right? And it causes us not to really enjoy life. That's why I wanted you to think about it in the beginning. Am I really enjoying life? I mean, is this journey that I'm I'm really enjoying it? Because listen, if I'm not, I'm missing something. Because Jesus said, even though the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what he said. I want you to look with me at Mark 4. Mark 4, verse 35. This event in the life of Christ, to me, embodies the balanced life that Peter is talking about. Between being calm and collected in spirit, while at the same time being cautious and attentive to what's going on around us. So Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he, that is Jesus, said to them, them is the disciples. So Jesus speaking to the disciples, he says to them, let us cross over to the other side. In other words, hey guys, we're going to the other side. That's important. Verse 36, now when they had left the multitude, They took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are a perishing? Now what's funny about that is those who are, let me be careful, those who are flipping out, (laughs) they're going to the one who's calm and collected in spirit, because they've misread the whole thing and they acting as if he don't care. You think they misunderstood that or not? 
And I'm going to tell you something, guys. Here's what I believe. I believe a balanced life. I'm serious. We're going to look like to the world and other religious people that we don't care. Because they're going to mistake the calm and collected spirit that you have. I, I, I believe the church is in trouble. I, I, I do, man. I think there's a great problem with it. But here's what I do know. Matt Rummage can't fix it. I mean, I've been at this for 15 years, and you better believe I've given 100, 110% to try to fix it. But I've come to the realization that the only one that can fix the problems that we as the church have is the one who has built it and is building it, and that's Jesus himself. So there's a sense of calm and collectedness about that issue, knowing that if I just listen and I avail myself to allow God to use me, he's going to use me as he wants to use me, you see? So I'm not running around sort of flipping out, all stressed and angry and frustrated over what's going on because I'm, all I can do is say, God, here I am. Speak to me. Talk to me. Tell me what I need to hear. Show me what I need to do. Show me what I need to believe. find that interesting. Look at verse 39. Then he arose and he rebuked the wind. So here's the calm and collected one who stands with attention and he speaks to the storm and it obeys him. He says, peace be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so afraid? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be? that even the wind and the sea obey him. One of the things that I ultimately think that the Lord is trying to teach us with this passage is how you and I can truly have peace in the midst of our storm. I really believe that. Because, I mean, have you ever thought about the absurdity? I mean, here you've got the disciples. They're scared to death, y'all. I mean, hey, master, do you not care we're dying here? I mean, how about waking up and doing something about this? I mean, so they're dying, and he's asleep, guys. And it's not because he took five Benadryl either, you know? Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at this story, I definitely see myself more in the disciples, right? Anybody with me? I mean, man, the storm comes, man, and, you know, things is, you're, you're really trying to, because Jesus said, let's go to the other side. So you're with him, you're following, and then all of a sudden, man, World War III breaks out in life, and it's just like, man, I'm, I'm relating with them. As I'm all in a tizzy, man, I'm flipping out, man. I'm, I'm like, whoa, here. But Jesus is asleep. I want to remind you of something. You and I are not disciples of the disciples. We are disciples of Jesus. And so I'm looking at my rabbi here, and I'm saying, man, if this is what he can do, then by the power of God and by grace through faith, I can do this as well in the storms of my life. But even though I see myself more in the disciples, things are changing. Things are changing. And I say amen to that. You ever wonder why he was so relaxed? You ever wonder why? I tell you why I believe Jesus was so relaxed because he knew who his daddy was. He knew who the father was. And if the father was saying, take them boys to the other side, guess what? That's what's going to happen. Because if Jesus is making a promise, it's going to be fulfilled. If Jesus says an elephant's going to have an egg or lay an egg, you better get the skillet ready, right? I mean, that's just it. If he says it, it's going to happen. So I want you to see something. Because here's, you can look in the life of Jesus and you see the marriage of both of these things. Calm and collected in spirit. But yet cautious and attention, always paying attention, man. They woke him up. What did he do? Obviously what the father was telling him to do, he speaks to the storm, peace be still, and it just lays down. It just lays down. 
He was never exercising his authority outside of what the Father was telling him and showing him to do. Let me ask this question, and we're just about done. What was it that the disciples needed to have done to calm down? I mean, really. What could they have done to relax and enjoy the wonderful boat ride that they were experiencing? What could they have done? Here's what they could have done. They could have stopped and thought, man, who's in the boat with us? You ever thought about just stopping and saying, who is it that really lives in me? Who's in this life with me? Talked about it last week. Paul declared, Christ lives in me. The anointed one. With all of the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God, every bit of that that he has is right there inside of the believer. So they could have just stopped and said, man, guys, hey, remember, the Son of God's with us, man. Think about all we've seen him do. The Son of God's with us. But not only that, here's, 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 here's a good point. He'd already told them, hey, guys, we're going to the other side. So not only could they have just stopped and thought, well, who's in the boat with us? They could have just stopped and thought, well, man, what did he, what did he tell us? So I realize that some of you may be here this morning and life has pressed you, man. And you've let it get the best of you. It's frustrating. Pastor isn't here to beat you up today. Your pastor's here to remind you who's in this life with you. Your pastor's here to remind you of the promises of God. Because the only way you're going to ever balance this thing out is to embrace him and to listen to what he's saying and believe. I don't have anything other to tell you than that. That'll be the only way that you're able to balance it out. So herein lies the key for you and I to get balance, to be sober and to be vigilant. If you want to go back to 1 Peter chapter 5, look at what it says immediately following his exhortation to be sober, to be vigilant. Look what it says in verse 9. Resist him. Come on, devil. Give me your best shot. Is that what he said? Try that some. No, don't try that. that that's terrible. Don't do that. It would be like me getting in the ring with, uh, you know, Andre the Giant or something. I mean, just don't try that, okay? Because, you know, you need to remember that you're, you're no match for him, and that, that's a humble reminder. So it's not, hey, give me your best shot, you know? But he says, resist him, and then he tells you how. Look what he says. Look what he says. I mean, you want me to bring you back to the simplicity of this thing? How do we resist him? Steadfast in the faith. Right? Now, hey, Matt, try a little bit harder next time, you know? Don't be so gullible next time, Matt. Don't don't buy into his junk. That's not what he says. He says resist him, and we do so by being steadfast in the faith. That's interesting. Peter writing to persecuted believers, he says, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So there's no doubt that he's writing to suffering believers who are a little bit stressed. They're a little bit frustrated. And the last thing they are is calm and collected in spirit because all you know what is breaking loose around them. But Peter knows and he understands because of the Holy Spirit that they have an adversary, that they have an accuser who is there saying, where's your God at now? I mean, look at what, what, look at what your faith has got you now. 
Or on the other hand, look at what you're going through. This is for what you've done, and God is just punishing you and giving you what you deserve for the decisions that you've made in your life. I don't know how it comes for you. But I can understand what these guys are going through. You can only imagine all the accusations that are being made by the enemy that's causing these people to stress and go crazy and get frustrated in that in their circumstance. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because yes, here's the real issue. You have an adversary, the devil, the accuser, who's going about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So what Peter does in verse 9 is he points us all back to what we've been talking about for a couple months now. The importance of listening to God. The importance of hearing what God has to say. Not just hearing, but believing. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. You ready? The only hope that you have to be sober and to be vigilant and to marry those two together and balance them in your life is faith in the truth of God. That's your only hope. The accuser is no one to fear, ladies and gentlemen. God says twice that the works of the devil have been defeated. He says it in Hebrews and he says it in the book of 1 John. And the only thing that he could possibly use against us, Jesus nailed to the cross at Calvary according to Colossians chapter 2. The only thing he had was the handwriting of the requirements that was against you. Jesus came, he fulfilled that, he lived the life you couldn't live, and then he died the death that you deserve for messing it all up. And for continuing to mess it up. So ladies and gentlemen, what does he really have to use against you? He is the father of lies. He is the master of deceit. And his accusations are not pretty. His accusations are not the way God sees it. It's fitting that we had a baptism today. And I certainly didn't plan this around it, but baptism is a beautiful illustration of who we are as believers. It's a beautiful illustration of who I am and who I forever will be. I will be always be one who has been crucified with Christ, buried with Him, but also raised with Him to live a new life as a new creation, filled with the anointed one, all of His power through the Holy Spirit. That's who I am. I don't know about you, but there just came a point in my life and several points in my life where I I just get sick and tired of trying to fulfill everybody's expectations for me. You know? I mean, the world will beat you to death for it. It's going to beat you to death for it. Because once you get here, it's always going to be, well, I need to get here. And once you get there, then it's, I'm going to need to get here. I believe one of the most important questions we could ever ask and answer in our lives is the question, who am I? Who am I? some of you here today and you are literally allowing the enemy to devour your life and because he's devouring you with his lies and with his accusations in other words you refuse to listen to who God says that you are because God says you're significant God says you're his child you're his beloved he says that you're his you're reconciled you're all of those things you matter this world you're, you're, you have the pen- potential to be a world changer. He says all this, but, but, but there's some of you, you absolutely refuse to listen and believe what he's saying about who you are. So he's got you, the enemy, the accuser's got you on all these paths 
that, that to try to get you to feel significant. Whether it's you think, well, I just need more money. Because everybody around you is just, they're here, they're there, they've got this, they've got that. And so he's convinced you to really be significant. You've got to have more money. Or you've got to have this job. Or young people, you got to hang with this crowd, or you got to be with this person in a relationship, or you got to do these things or do those things to really be significant. But here's the thing I want to challenge you with as we close. There's some of you here, you're allowing the enemy to devour you with his accusation. And because he's devouring you, he's devouring everybody that's around you. And I'll never forget this. My stepdad's here today and can testify to this. I know he's getting older, but I think he can remember this. I'm telling you, and I told, this, I told a couple this week, one of the most significant happenings in my life was a question of, you know, just literally how much longer are you going to let the devil, the enemy, ruin your life with his lies? You see, man, we want to keep making it about the people thing. It's me against you. It's me against them. It's me against my circumstances or me against what I don't have in life. But I'm asking you this morning, are there some people here that are just ready to draw a line in the sand? And I'm not asking you to to make any commitments in and of your own flesh to do better, to try harder, or any of that. But I'm just wondering if anybody just needs to draw a line and say, I'm sick and tired of the enemy having his way with me and saying these things and me believing it and giving in to it and allowing him to stress me out, frustrate me, and ruin me and ruin the people around me. Is anybody here that's just ready to draw a line in the sand? Anybody? Time to, to stop letting him have his way. You see, it's interesting that he says he's a roaring lion who's going about seeking whom he may devour because really the only time that the lion roars when you study a lion's life is after he's already defeated his prey and won him. So I don't know if Peter's really just telling us how stupid the enemy is or what. <laughs> But honestly, man, when you're close to the Father and you're in tune with His voice, the enemy stands out like a sore thumb. He stands out like a deer hunter who's walking through the woods with his bright orange on. So, I mean, really, who's ready to draw the line? And all you're ultimately saying is, I- I'm... I'm tired of listening to his lies and believing his accusations. And you've got to understand something real quick. How does the enemy work? Read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. The Bible literally says he takes people captive to do his will. The crazy thing is he'll take people that are close to you, right around you, that you love and respect, and sometimes he'll use them to be the ones who are accusing you. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should have this. You should have that. You should be here by now. You should be there by now. (laughs) Really? No, because where God wants me to simply be is just, hey, God, thank you that I'm a child. I'm going to tell you something cool that illustrates this. Real, I wasn't even going to plan to tell it, but this morning, i got to say this. I forgot to tell my man to turn on the Baptistry this morning or yesterday. I usually call Harry or somebody, Pope. I, 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 call, I, I forgot. But I believe God on this day wanted me to do this for this purpose. I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning. I have not, I've been up since 3 o'clock this morning. <laughs> so I'm probably going to go home and take a nap. I don't know if I really can do that, but I'm going to probably do it. But I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning. I used the restroom. I go back to bed. I'm tossing and I'm turning. And I finally just stopped and realized, God, Am I up for a reason? And this is no lie. As soon as I stopped and I said, all right, God, I'm listening. If you got something to say, I'm, I'm right here, okay? I'm going to quit tossing and turning and getting mad because I can't sleep. 
And I mean, it was within a split second God put Kayla's face and Sonny's face in my mind. And I said, oh, my goodness, I'm baptizing them in the morning. So at 3.30, I come over here, I turn the baptistry on, and I get everything going and all that kind of jazz and everything going on. But I hope you get my point. It's amazing how God works. But I'll tell you guys, I'm not going to complicate this thing for you. I refuse to. How do you resist him? Steadfast in the faith. Hearing and believing. You ready to draw the line or not? I don't need you to come forward to solidify any success to this message that I've shared. God's going to use it however. But I am going to do something I've never done. Well, I haven't done it in a long time. I don't invite you to publicly stand and say, look, I'm ready to draw the line. If you don't stand and if you don't come to this altar, doesn't mean you're not serious. And I'm not going there with you guys. I'm not doing it. But I'm just inviting you to draw the line. I'm sick and tired of listening to your junk anymore. I'm sick and tired of listening to your accusations. I'm not going to believe them anymore. It's time to listen to the voice of truth. The voice that desires to set me free. It's the difference in your life being bound. It's the difference in you bringing life or death to the people that's around you. That's how serious this is. I don't know about you, but I long for a boundless life. But I want you to understand the only place you're going to find it is in Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. As your children to hear you, to hear your voice, the voice of truth, the truth that sets us free. Thank you, Father, for not only the opportunity to believe you, to hear you, but the opportunity by grace to claim it as ours and to believe it and receive it truth that you have to say about it. And God, if nothing else, Lord, I stand before this group of individuals today as your child, as your beloved child, filled with your life, with all of your power, even the power that raised the dead dwells in me. And God, I have no excuse. Lord, may we be your sons and daughters are willing to say today, God, I'm listening. Speak. Show me. Help me believe. In Jesus' name, amen. As we're still standing.